Warning, most of the words in this podcast aren't fuck, but some of them are. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by IP Vanish and by the new international competition for atheists where we see how many things that are expressly forbidden by the Bible we can convince homophobic bakers to do before they catch on. So be sure to tune in for the No Shrimpix. The No Shrimpix. Because some words are really hard to rhyme shit with. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hey, how you doing, guys? Kevin Sorbo here. This is out, uh, shout out to Noah, Heath, and Eli. This is booked by Chris. And he wants me to tell you guys that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. Um, but then monkeys are still around. Hmm. Doesn't everything that evolves from something else doesn't exist anymore? I don't know. Call me crazy. Uh, anyway, all the best, guys. A lot of stuff coming out. Check out my latest movie, Let There Be Light and The Reliant. Both movies streaming on Amazon. Check it out. Make some popcorn over Christmas and watch it. And uh, three other movies coming out as well. Staying Busy and two new series starting next year. So you better watch them, man. You better watch them or I'll go Hercules on you. All right, guys. All the best. Take care and have a great, great, great Christmas and a really good new year. Bye. It's July 29th. And it's National Cheese Sacrifice Purchase Day. What? Okay. The the crucifix <laughs> is a little much, but uh appreciate the commitment, I guess. <laughs> I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Carly Lloyd's, New Jersey. Nice. Sure. Rose Lavelle's Ohio <laughs> okay. and Kelly O'Harris, Georgia. This is the Scathing Atheist. <laughs> This week's episode, European courts decide that not being Muslim is neutral. Mm -hmm. A pastor plays with dog shit very enthusiastically. And that wasn't just a euphemism for being a pastor. But first, the diatribe. I doubt that it would surprise any of our regular listeners to learn that a movie is basically ruined for me as soon as the narrative doesn't add up. I'm not talking about scientific inaccuracies and shit. I'm a big fan of the MCU. Gamma rays turn you into a mood-specific giant rage monster. Whatever. I'm with you. Tell me your story. I mean, yes, it drives me a little fucking nuts when a Star Trek movie forgets how gravity works. But by and large, I can get through bad science in a movie without sounding like Neil deGrasse Tyson's Twitter feed. But when they fuck up the narrative, I'm entirely torn out of things. You know, like when you're sitting there going like, OK, but how does he know that she knows that? Or why wouldn't they just call so and so on the phone? I'm checking out. If the story doesn't add up, then there's no point but the explosions. Now, I have no evidence to back this up but my anecdotal experience, but I feel like this need for a cohesive narrative in movies has to correlate with atheism to some degree. I mean, that's how I wound up here. Started off with my parents' Christianity. The narrative didn't add up, so I started looking for something that made more sense. I got sucked into neo-pagan woo for a bit, and it was easier to forgive the contradictions there because there was no orthodoxy. Right? If I, if I read something that conflicted with the stuff I already believed, I could reject that author without fucking up my whole narrative. But wrong always portrays itself if you wait long enough, and eventually all the scaffolds of dried bullshit that I built to hold up my narrative started to break apart, so I reluctantly embraced reality. Of course, when you change your beliefs as radically as I did, you're often called upon to justify that change. And when I did, I'd simply appealed to the narrative. I'd show my old neo-pagan friends places where their narrative just didn't make any sense. I'd point to ways that magic could be proven to exist if it were real. I'd point out that the definition of the word energy seems to shift constantly to fill particular needs with them. I'd point out that there was no actual historical record to justify the supposed ancient origins of their mystical knowledge. And by and large... Nobody would argue with any of the specific examples I gave. They'd just chastise me for being too cynical or too literal. Come to think of it, it's the same thing people do when I point out plot holes in movies. But that's just the thing. Not everybody needs the narrative to tie together. I mean, I get that when it comes to movies to some degree, but it's hard for me to even contemplate a perspective where, you know, I'm okay with reality not adding up because like plot holes in reality are lies. <laughs> they're, they're proof that the thing you're being told isn't true. And yet for some people, that's not all that convincing. 
Many people don't bother to put together a cohesive narrative to undergird their worldview at all. And some people actively avoid doing that for fear that it would cause the whole thing to fall apart. Now, this disconnect is the source of a lot of confusion when we try to communicate with the other side. You see situations constantly where the skeptic's entire defense is just to state the other side's narrative, and then they feel like it should be done. They should be finished at that point, right? You say something like, okay, so you're saying that God sacrificed himself to himself to appease himself for offending himself? Or you say like, so you're saying that water has a memory and knows what used to be in it to the dilution of one atom per Indian Ocean? Or... So you're saying there's a group of people that are clever and sneaky enough to rule the world, but not clever and sneaky enough to leave the evidence out of their company logos. And for us, that seems like slam dunk shit, right? If the narrative doesn't make sense, the assertion doesn't make sense. But if you don't need a concrete narrative, none of that shit matters. Your narrative can always bend however it has to so that every question lands in the same conclusion eventually. For you and me, having such a flexible narrative is just bad epistemology, but for them, it's a point of pride. It's an open mind, right? As setting aside all the justifications for racism and sexism and shit, that's usually what people mean when they deploy the just asking questions defense. I'm not defending any one narrative. I don't even have one, right? In fact, for a lot of these people, they go out of their way to avoid one. Yes, certain moral precepts and bumper sticker slogans are sacrosanct, but how you get there can change from day to day, hour to hour, from point to counterpoint, of course, the need for a harmonious narrative isn't the exclusive domain of atheism. There are plenty of religious people with the same needs, and they're always a little bit more pathetic in their arguments, right? They're the ones that construct whole schools and museums and amusement parks to try to insulate their brains from virtually all scientific knowledge. But far more common are the people who know better than to check their own math. They want questions and they get pissed off at answers. They scour the world for some shred of evidence that disproves the scientific worldview, not so that they can substitute it with some other worldview, but so that they can justify their complete lack of one. And much like a person defending their movie against my pedantry, they get really pissed off when you point out the plot holes in their open mind. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Clotho and Lachesis to my Atropos, Heath Edwright, and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to thread our way through the headlines? Okay, but I get the eye first this week. Heath totally wasted his turn comparing sconces on Amazon, so... Uh, I have no idea what just happened. With <laughs> <sconces>. <laughs> well, we've got a fight to sort out and an intro to explain, so we're going to take a quick break for a word from this week's sponsor, IP Vanish. And so I said, look, it's a security camera on my house. Where or how I zoomed is my business. And and what did the judge say? Okay, so get this. He says, how did you get into my house? Police, police. Typical. Eli? So, Eli? Hey, Heath, what's up? Yeah, so what did you do? What's on my face? What is this? Oh, uh, that. I. Uh, that's your internet history. Okay, why did you write my internet history on my face in permanent marker? I mean, why did you Google illegal secret karate movies? I, it's, I, I thought there might be some. It's, that's irrelevant. So I, I just figured since you weren't using IP Vanish, you didn't care who saw what you did online, and I just made it a little bit more obvious. Oh, what's IP Vanish? IP Vanish is a virtual private network, a VPN for short. A VPN is a super important tool that helps you safely browse the internet. You can use a VPN on your computers, tablets, phones, even things like your Fire Stick when you're streaming media. When you use a VPN, all your data is encrypted. What you're reading, what you're searching, what you're watching, whatever it is you're doing. Like Googling, way to use height advantage on a child in Mario. In Mario, okay, it's the GTO optimal strategy, game theory optimal. That's what okay, I, I'm, so I have a good reason. For listeners of our show, IP Vanish is offering an incredible 65% off for just $349 for the first month or $3149 for the year. Wow, that's a great deal. Where do I sign up? Just go to IPVanish.com slash scathing to claim your 65% savings. They have plans starting at $349 or $3149 a year. This is the time to sign up with our discount and the current promotional offerings. You can get a VPN for 65% off their usual offering. IP Vanish is the best of the best, even rated 4.7 out of 5 on Trustpilot, and that's with more than 6,000 reviews. Show these guys some love. They're repeat sponsors. Remember, it's IPVanish.com slash scathing to get the deal and start protecting yourself online. All right. Thanks, Eli. What are you? Stop. Get off me. What are you doing? What? You're not going to Google how to get Sharpie off face? No. No. Yeah, okay, I am. Just write small. No. 
And now back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, never thought I'd say I miss Jerry Falwell Jr., but at least <laughs> back in his day, the disturbing stories out of Liberty University were funny, right? Yep. I mean, sure. Sometimes he'd warn his students to arm up in case they needed to murder Muslims. And sometimes he'd use the student body to slave labor to produce pro-Trump propaganda. But he'd do it while drunkenly stumbling down a flight of stairs with his dick out or something. Right. So we could at least all have a good chuckle about it. But that's no longer the case, apparently. Because the latest news out of Liberty U is a lawsuit by 12 women alleging that the campus's honor code created an environment that increased the likelihood of sexual assault and rape. I mean, literally everything about Liberty U increases the likelihood of sexual assault. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I, I guess the honor code is included in that. So, yeah. yeah. Also, just to be clear, the literal name of the honor code is the Liberty Way. Yep. <laughs> That's the name of an honor code. Yeah. Now, as you'll likely recall, Lucinda talked about this briefly in last week's show, but the news broke a little bit too late for us to get into any details in the headline segment. But it's too big a story for us to just devote a minute of the show to it. So, uh, and, and also it's like a perfect example of one of the biggest dangers of our cultural tolerance for religious bigotry. The lawsuit comes from women who were students, employees, and campus visitors. And though their individual cases vary wildly in their details, they all have at their heart the fact that the university's policies either created the opportunity for their assault, denied them an opportunity at justice after the fact, punished them for their victimhood, or some combination of the three. In other words, it's not just that women were more likely to be assaulted on their campus. It was that the university's code of conduct guaranteed it. Yeah. When you take all of this together, this university has what can only be described as a pro-rape code of conduct. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So any university is going to be problematic when 15 out of 19 senior leadership positions, including the president, are specifically cishet white men. That's already Mm -hmm. a problem. Then you add evangelical Christianity and the business model at that point is sex crime before it even happens. Yep. What the fuck? Mm, right. By the way, two women out of that whole 19. Jesus Ooh. Christ. So now look, th- this is primarily a comedy show, so I don't want to go into a lot of details here, but we'll link to the actual complaints if you want them. Suffice to say, we're not talking about like the university didn't put up enough lighting in high traffic areas, though they also didn't do that shit. We're talking about shit like policies that actively discourage victims from reporting their assault, rules that punish sexual assault victims and retaliation against women who did report their abuse. Like in one complaint, a guy roofied some girl and raped her, but she was told by the university that if she filed an official complaint, they'd have to expel her for drinking alcohol. The fuck? Yeah. Yeah. Another victim faced expulsion because it was against the rules to be in a room with the opposite sex to begin with. Cool, 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 cool. I'm glad these places don't have to pay taxes or follow laws. That's fun. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could just build a little wall around the campus and then it declares itself Rapevania. It's the nation state of Rapevania. Their own goddamn police department. Yeah. It's horrible. It's terrifying. And look, when you read over the specific complaints, it's clear that there was at least to some degree an intentional effort to make their campus more accommodating to rapists. But there's also a lot of ways where it wasn't intentional, and that's not less horrifying. Okay, all of Christianity is based on literal Bronze Age concepts of sexuality. So, like, even when you try to build new structures on top of that to bring those in line with modernity, you're still building on that foundation. The problem isn't how you define chastity, Liberty University. It's that you define chastity. This shit is inevitably going to rise from that. You're a goddamn college, or at least that's you. You tell people you're a college when you're taking their fucking money. Yeah. Anyway, Eli, too funny. Too funny. And in Hail Mary Picks with Face News. Just taking a second while the grinder users who listen to our podcast enjoy my excellent joke. Okay. I feel like they need another minute. We'll wait. Another. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, they got it. This week, <laughs> news outlets everywhere were buzzing with the always good news that yet another homophobic right wing Catholic priest, Monsignor Jeffrey Burrill, got caught being gay. And we here at The Scathing Atheist are happy to celebrate that. Well, several sympathetic news stories were quick to point out that there's nothing wrong with being gay. And there's not. He wasn't committing any crimes. And he wasn't. And he wasn't even fucking any kids. Side note, you know you're the bad guy if that's your defense, Mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't change the fact that his job was to condemn being gay and pretend to be a celibate virgin in direct communication with the divine. 
He did that right up until the second he got caught on the app Grinder. Yeah. Also, keep in mind, this is a guy whose most recent public statements were threatening to take away Joe Biden's magical yes. cracker if he didn't stop killing babies. Yes. Right. Exactly. So, Probably exact words. Yeah. <laughs> so celebrating consequences for empowered, bigoted hypocrites aside, there is one element to this story that's downright fucking weird and therefore worth mentioning. Namely, the way in which Beryl was caught, which appears to be commercially harvested cell phone data. Huh. So they've got like a fucking Hollywood hacker room full of people tracking the possible gayness of priests with fucking satellite technology. But when it comes to raping McRaperson being in charge of the youth group again, how the fuck should they know? It's impossible for them to know in advance. <laughs> yeah. Am I right? It's Can Cambridge Analytica not do something for good once in a while? At least? <laughs> Catch the fucking terrible rape. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Now, I should point out, we have very little information about how the data in question was acquired, who acquired it, and how Burrell was parsed from that data as being in the places that he was. But the Catholic news outlet that broke the story, The Pillar, described it as, quote, an analysis of app data signals correlated to Burrell's mobile device shows the priest also visited gay bars and private residences while using a location-based hookup app in numerous cities from 2018 to 2020, even while traveling on assignment for the U.S. Bishops' Conference, end quote. Okay, aren't most of you church people conservative libertarians? Aren't, sorry, what? Nothing. Oh, they said nothing. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Nothing. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not talking about that anymore. And again, I, I don't want to get like too conspiracy minded here. That is vague as shit, right? That could mean everything from a dude sold us screenshots of Burrell's account and we want to make it sound fancy to Facebook has a new track your local pastor feature. I do not know. And that information is not forthcoming. But not knowing is worrying because while they don't particularly mind using data to out hypocritical bigots living double lives the bad uses of that information on the lgbtq app grinder mm -hmm. are pretty fucking terrifying yeah. okay what he needs is the maga phone do you guys hear about the maga yeah. phone <laughs> untrackable but seriously this is one of those times that I agree with libertarians and I don't like it. I don't like this feeling your <laughs> location data especially as it relates to your sexual preference should be super private if you want it to be. Uh, like, maybe if he's organizing a terrorism cell on Grinder, which yeah, I'm guessing is kind of rare, and, and there's a rigorous FISA warrant involved, maybe then, but I'm still not a big fan, even then. Yeah, like, I mean, at this point, I, I'm all for tagging priests with the collar they use for, like, endangered wolves and shit. But yeah, I, I mostly agree with, yeah. Right, yeah. And, <laughs> and all of this is made even more disturbing by the fact that the Catholic News Agency has reported that in 2018, they were approached by an anonymous outside party that offered to track clergy to see who was on hookup apps based on their IP addresses. Now, the Catholic News Agency said no to that, but it's pretty obvious from this story from the pillar that someone said yes or also had that idea. Point is, you do not need to feel bad for this bigot getting caught being a hypocrite, but like... I barely want this technology in good hands, people, which means it's already in bad ones. And that I am definitely worried about. Yeah. All right. Next up in headlines, we have a rare piece of good news. Oh, we right. can really use it right now. Bring yeah. it back. Yeah, Pete. Bring it go. back. The Christian right is in a state of abject terror. Thanks to critical race. Theory, yes, they are. Fantastic. But don't get too excited it's also terrifying if you think about the big picture here mm -hmm. so don't just don't do that for a second we're going <laughs> to focus on the small picture because we want to and this is the internet and that's how it works now we're go. doing small picture uh, wrong show heath but i appreciate okay. the effort <laughs> <laughs> the idea of people being called out on their long history of privilege represents the christian rights deepest fear and they're in this delightful panic they're just Lowering themselves into the bat cave full of critical race theory. <laughs> They're not doing well facing that fear. And one of the latest examples was a claim from Alex McFarland, the president of the Southern Evangelical Seminary. He's pretty sure that the SJWs are making university music departments ban 
sheet music <laughs> and also ban the tuning of musical instruments really? because hmm. that stuff is racist. Okay. All right. So I know this is going to turn out to be silly at all because I've read ahead, but given what I know about history, like if you told me the entire purpose of creating a sheet music was to keep black people from voting, my first at reaction definitely wouldn't be doubt. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, yeah. That, that tracks. That tracks perfectly with U.S. history. It's not what's happening here, but yes, I agree with you. So here's the exact words from McFarland during an appearance on some stupid fucking show. He said, <laughs> quote, <laughs> I had breakfast about three months ago with the head of a music department at a major East Coast university. Already lying. Yep. He's making this whole thing up. He's already lying. <laughs> and I want to protect this individual. But if I told you the name of it, everybody listening would know the name. This is a major state-supported school. And, okay, more lying. It's, it's lying plus... This audience could not name a bunch of East Coast universities. <laughs> There's no way. If this audience could find the East Coast on a map of the U.S., I'd be impressed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, continuing. The head of the music department is a born-again Christian. When they had faculty orientation, the music department was told, you can't use the word sheet music. It's two words. Yep. It's fine. <laughs> You know the score with music? Yep, yep. Yeah, got sheet, it. I know sheet, what <laughs> sheet music is. Continuing one more time, don't say sheet music because you know who wears sheets? The KKK, end quote. <laughs> and you know who liked music? Adolf Hitler. Adolf <laughs> Bethesda Hitler, yeah. And here's the part about the other CRT, critical race tuning. I cannot fucking believe that this, this is real. is fucking bananas. McFarland continued. They were also told at that meeting don't tell your violinists they have to tune their instruments. And we have a tuning fork, A440, 440 cycles per second. That's European. That's male patriarchy. And <laughs> real quick. I was wondering which kind of patriarchy it was. I'm glad he cleared that <laughs> up. So I honestly don't know if thinking European and patriarchy are synonyms demonstrates ignorance or knowledge, right? <laughs> <laughs> so obviously... This was a big combination of stupid liar and or stupid liar. Yes, it was. McFarland <laughs> clearly heard a story about Oxford University expanding its music curriculum to include more composers who aren't white men from Europe, very specifically. <laughs> and that's the whole story. That's, that's the right. entire yeah. story yeah. about Oxford. <laughs> but thanks to a bunch of conservative idiots on the Internet, that story got warped into some nonsense about Critical race theory gone too far. My very good friend using that anonymous speaker voice thing from the kidnapping movie <laughs> told me they canceled the C note. C note got fired. They can't use it no more. Yep. That's what happened. And McFarlane made up a giant lie to go along with that warped story he heard about. <laughs> because, of course, this is the Christian right, and that's how it works now. And then just always, just yeah. always, they lie. Yep. They're liars okay. who lie from that the That one's for this show for yeah. sure. Oh, yeah. that one. <laughs> That's our slogan. New catchphrase. And in it's a tough hit job, but someone's got to do it. News. Well done. That's Thank you. Good stuff. Thank you. Last week, the Court of Justice of the European Union issued a ruling that upheld a ban on religious headwear from two employers, stating that, quote, a prohibition on wearing any visible form of expression of political, philosophical, or religious beliefs in the workplace may be justified by the employer's need to present a neutral image towards customers or to prevent social disputes, end quote. And uh, much as I hate to say it, kind of feels like CJEU missed the ball on this one, right? Yeah. Uh, seriously, fuck you, EU Court of Justice. You're making me have sympathy for people who wear magic hats, and I don't like it. I, was, I agreed with libertarians earlier. You didn't know about that. I was from a different story, but now I agree with that. I don't like any of this. If you're in a dispute, by the way, and Heath Enright sides with magical hats instead of you, it's a bad sign for you. You did yeah. something wrong. Such a bad sign. Yeah. I, the, the, um, some of their customers might be bigots, though. Excuse isn't exactly helping either, to what? be honest. <laughs> no, it's kind of like wearing a Trump 2020 T-shirt. They should yeah. have to wear it. Now, I want to say at the outset that the idea of religious headdresses is a complicated issue, right? Like, yes, people should be able to wear whatever magic hats they want, but mm. it's also important we acknowledge that if you're going to be shunned by your family and maybe physically attacked if you take off your magic hat, you're not 
choosing to wear right it. yeah now, so that aside banning magic hats doesn't feel like a move in the right direction not wearing a magic hat isn't by definition neutral and it's not exactly a minor detail that the religious bands like these affect majority non-white religions right yeah. this is not right well, so, so look in principle i'm all for giving religious people no special privileges, even when it comes to the rule against wearing hats or whatever. Yeah, me too. But that was never on the table. Right. So it's hard to get behind just giving those privileges to one religion. Yeah, that's definitely not the answer. Mm. So, yeah, I point this out not just because it, it is actually worth noting whenever religious freedoms are in danger, but also because I've seen this painted, especially in a lot of like mainstream media outlets as like the atheist agenda. And no, no, it's not. Yeah. I don't want anyone to wear a magic hat, but I want them to take it off voluntarily because magic hats are stupid and they know that. Not because they have to choose between wearing it and losing their jobs. So. Yeah. And speaking of religions and telling people what they can and can't wear, we're going to pause for a minute and hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucid. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate race. And it's a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure every abortion provider in the country would happily do away with the anti-choice protesters and agitators in a heartbeat if they could. But you gotta admit, it would be terrible for business. After all, the people who are most in favor of ensuring safe and affordable access to abortion also tend to be the ones pushing for the policies that make it unnecessary. Of course, the point for anti-abortion activists is, first and foremost, to force births. And you can't exactly force a woman to give birth if they don't get pregnant in the first place. So they tend to oppose both abortion and all the things that have been shown to reduce their frequency. We got another great example of this from the Iowa Department of Public Health a couple of weeks ago. See, back in 2017, then-governor of Iowa, Terry Branstad, needed to prove how much he hated abortion. So he signed a bill that targeted the funding of Planned Parenthood. It rejected $3 million in federal money for the Iowa Family Planning Network and replaced it with a state-run program that forbade the use of their funds at providers that offer abortion. Because, you know, there are so many family planning facilities that don't offer abortion. Well, to the surprise of literally nobody who thought it through at all, this led to a shocking increase in the total number of abortions. They did manage to close down a couple of Planned Parenthood facilities, and I'm sure they cracked a bottle of champagne for each one. But by depriving people of all the educational tools and contraceptive access that comes with a nearby Planned Parenthood facility, they also caused a spike in unwanted pregnancies. So between 2018 and 2019, the number of abortions performed in Iowa shot up by 25% and shot up another 14% last year. Now, there are obviously far more serious problems with intentionally targeting family planning facilities than a rise in abortions. Less access to contraceptives generally also include a spike in sexually transmitted diseases and make it harder for poor women to access basic medical care. But if these idiots are unmoved by the fact that they're actually creating the non-problematic problem they're trying to solve, I doubt they're going to be moved by something as inconsequential as women's health. And as if that news wasn't enough to spur me into action this week, my arch nemesis, Lori Alexander, is at it again. And by it, I mean communicating with words, because pretty much any time she does that, I'm going to take issue with it. This time, she seemed to be all but directly refuting my reminder last week that shitty marriages are worse than divorces. And look, anytime you're trying to make the argument that people should stay in miserable marriages because divorce makes the baby Jesus sad, it's a losing argument. But Lori manages to make that bad argument badly by opening up on how her parents constantly fought and were unhappy most of the time. And if there's anybody out there that needs to avoid the and look how I turned out argument, it's Lori Alexander. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have got a bit of packing to do, so I'm going to hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. Next up in headlines, a Republican candidate for governor of Wisconsin was caught by a sting operation last week, suggesting that if anyone asks you for proof that you're vaccinated before entering a building, that is a violation of your Christian freedom of virus movement that's in the Bible somewhere, and you are allowed to shoot that person with a gun. Did he now? The Republican in question is Jonathan Wickman. And the sting operation was, 
his microphone at a faith and freedom <laughs> rally <laughs> where he gave a speech about how we need good Christian patriots to take over the government. I mean, we have bad Christian patriots now, so I guess I can't argue that that would be a... <laughs> I don't know, no. It kind of feels like good Christian patriot is a moron. You, you mean oxymoron? I said what I said. Okay, no, all right. I think okay. it's yes, yeah. <laughs> so Wickman was not charged with inciting domestic terrorism because, of course, that's covered by RIFRA for Christian white people anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You might be surprised to learn he's a Christian white guy. Weird. Wickman, who I was talking about, yeah. And here's what he had to say. Quote, I'm not a politician. <laughs> great, great start to your speech for <laughs> governorship. I'm a patriot. I want to make that very clear. I got in the fight last year because I saw something really evil coming across this land, especially in Wisconsin, the lockdowns. I've been following politics for 13 years, <laughs> 13 years. What? So okay. for part of his adulthood, which is now uh, attempting to become a politician, mm -hmm. he was not following politics yep. at all. Yeah, I wasn't big into it. <laughs> Continuing one more time. Thank God for President Trump, who is still the president, by the way. Oh. We all know that. <laughs> there are no truth tellers anymore in this country at the political level. It's what liars would say. We need good <laughs> Christian patriots to take over. You guys think the 13 years were consecutive or um, <laughs> or like maybe he just pays attention on the odd years, right? He catches yeah, up, he mix it up like the off yeah. season or something. I'm just I'm always so amazed at how stupid people will brag to you about how they just started giving a fuck about politics and that's why you should listen yeah. to them. I mean, there's no other realm of knowledge where people are like, hey, I just tried cooking for the very first time. I'm pretty sure I know way more than them so-called chefs in the kitchen. So <laughs> who wants some raw chicken? Yeah. And if you're like, no, I literally went to culinary school. I know more than you. They're like, boo, nerd doesn't count. Yeah. Yep. Racist. <laughs> right. So that was stupid. Unfortunately, the... High watermark was stupid. <laughs> yep, that was, the, that was the peak. From there, we got the call for domestic terrorism. After his remarks, he got a question about a new bill in Wisconsin that would ban any business or government entity from having any kind of vaccination requirement. And Wickman said, quote, if something goes against your conscience, if you know because God told you, we're all created by God in his image and God gave us certain rights that no man can trample on. If you know in your heart that something is wrong, do not comply. It doesn't matter if there's a law on the table or not. And if they try to press their luck, we have the Second Amendment. It's a law on the table. Uh, laws don't count if you have a gun. Yep. Is his gubernatorial platform. Vote for me now. Okay. Two things. One, Jonathan and his followers, please try that out. Well, Second... <laughs> The question was about a ban on vaccine requirements. So he accidentally was like, yeah, if they put a ban on vaccine requirements and you want everyone to yeah, get vaccinated, shoot me in the fucking <laughs> face. <laughs> so you might be wondering, is that the same Jonathan Wickman who wrote healing from asthma, my personal journey, doctoring myself into optimal health and freedom from asthma? <laughs> yes, it is. That's the <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. Healing from asthma. Blah, 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 blah. From asthma. <laughs> freedom from <laughs> asthma at the end of it. He doctored himself into freedom from asthma. asthma. In his title. <laughs> yep. That's the guy. He's also the owner of a digital marketing firm that provides, this is a quote from their website, lead generation for B2B companies by custom designing a 360 degree ROI focused plan. Oh, he's a bullshitologist. <laughs> he sure is. <laughs> That's, yeah. that's what a B2B company is to me. <laughs> what the fuck was 360 degrees I don't as, know. as relating to that plan? Oh, thank God I've got leads behind me as well. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> They're hiding leads at other companies? I want to see the plan that isn't ROI focused. You know, like we're, right. we're just trying to make the columns even really. We're, we're focused on <laughs> negative investment potential here at this other company. You know what? I'm going with Jonathan Wickman's thing because it's focused on <laughs> He's got 360 profit. degrees of ROI focus over there. <laughs> you guys got 270 of, well, actually 270 is better if you're focused on negative. It's complicated. It's a lot of business terms. You literally can't see his plan unless you're wearing an Oculus Quest. That's how impressive it is. <laughs> and uh, by the way, here's a few other fun facts I learned 
from a recent interview that Wickman did about his political aspirations. According to Wickman, don't say you're good at flying children's I, toys. Yeah, I'm very good at flying <laughs> remote control airplanes. Literal exact quote. Also, in the wintertime as a kid, I created the best snow tunnels at Wilson Park. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fuck Frank. <laughs> Don't listen to what that motherfucker tells you. Yeah. Liar. I mean, the guy at Central Park had really fucking good ones, but I was winning at Wilson Park. <laughs> I'll shoot him. I'll shoot him right in the fucking face. <laughs> if, you hear, if you hear Frank say otherwise. <laughs> And in our millionth headline tonight, Monica Cole, <laughs> thank you, Excellent. who is as pumps. near as we can tell from her Twitter account, approximately 995,855 of the eponymous moms in her ambitiously titled <laughs> group 1 Million Moms. Well, she found something that she was pissed off yet again. This week's target is Eli Lilly, the company most famous for you know, shit like burying research that showed Prozac increased suicidal behavior, getting sued for pushing antipsychotic medications for unapproved uses. And of course, there's the chief malefactor in the heartless price gouging of insulin. But none of that was enough to rouse Cole's decimally challenged ire. Instead, she's pissed because one of their ads implied that transgendered people both exist now and should continue to in the future. They're just like, you were supposed to be on the side of killing kids, you train <laughs> Right, yeah. Okay, when she finds out they're price gouging trans people, I feel like she's going to be super confused. Yeah, and right. Yeah, right. That's going to soften it. So the ad campaign in question is obviously a desperate effort to distract from the policy of extorting diabetics, or, or maybe they're just pissed because... You know, they're not getting all the free we made a vaccine, though, ads that their competitors are giving. <laughs> Regardless, the theme of the campaign is that they're super woke. And you can tell because they don't bar black people from buying their medicine. And one of the lines in the ads reads, quote, the body you are randomly assigned at birth shouldn't determine how well you are cared for, end quote. And as if that wasn't a blatant enough effort to, in her words, push transgenderism, it also shows, quote, a transgendered man, by which she means fucking woman, but she's an asshole, wearing right. flashy <laughs> makeup, end quote, and also someone recovering from top surgery. Look, if you want to change your gender, it's one thing, but glitter eye makeup before fall, Christ won't stand <laughs> for it. <laughs> also, just for the record, I'm not sure that Jesus is cis or het, necessarily. Like, he might identify as non-binary, right? That would make sense. Tertiary, maybe, according to the Catholic. <laughs> <Yeah. Catholic. laughs> we should celebrate that. Yeah. Like He's that. a many-spirit. Right. Yeah. Non-binary Jesus. I like that uh, that figure. So, okay, so Cole posts a Jeremiah about this on our blog. For our less literate listeners, a Jeremiah is a lemonade made by a guy named nope. Jeremy. Nope. Yeah. So, anyway, she posts a Jeremiah where she explains why she's so concerned. Quote, can you imagine what goes through the mind of a child when he or she sees this ad? We all know children imitate what they see and repeat what they hear, end quote. So apparently she's worried that children are going to see these ads and get fucking mastectomies or something. So, Monica, if you're listening, and we know that you are. Big fan. I want to say you're getting warmer. Okay, you're hating the right <laughs> people now. For the wrong reasons. And that's better than what we've come to expect from you, right? So I'm willing to compliment you for that. Hell, before we know it, you're going to change your name to 100,000 moms and only be lying by two orders of magnitude. I have hope. <laughs> Honestly, 11 angry moms is scarier than your lie, Monica. I, I got to push tables together. I can't fit you all in a booth. Think about it. It's, just... it's pretty terrifying. And finally tonight. In pastor sticks his hands in a pile of dog shit during a sermon news. <laughs> a pastor literally stuck his hands in a pile of dog shit during a sermon. That's the story. <laughs> yeah. That's the entire story. Kind of fucked up my pun thing from the beginning, but there's really no other way to introduce that. You gotta just say it. Uh, okay, how about a talking poodle? Nope. No, nope. please yeah. don't interrupt. Shit. Here we are <laughs> looking for news about how religion is stupid as our job. Mm -hmm. And Pastor Dan Burgoyne of Rolling Hills Covenant Church in California decided to lose his goddamn mind and start working for us and do what I literally said just now. He gave a sermon last week about how God defines sin in the Bible. And in the middle of the speech, as a visual aid for that concept, he plunged his hands into a very large pile of dog shit that he brought from home. 
Well, folks, if you're going to plunge your hands in shit, I, I need you to be making a really important point. Spoiler <laughs> alert. <laughs> He is not. He's nope. not going to nope. do that. It's no. just, it's dirty. I mean, honestly, given their current stance against public health, I was assuming he was pushing back against the liberal cucks who say ingesting feces can give you hepatitis A, but it was even <laughs> dumber than that. So here's how Pastor Dan worked the pile of dog shit into his sermon. He says, do you know what God equates as sin in the Bible? He equates poop, filth in the Bible. And then he motions to a literal silver platter that he set up with a shockingly large amount of dog shit to which he clearly has access in his life. And he says, mm -hmm. no, this is not a brownie. No, this is not a Snickers bar. Who would have thought I was? own two bull mastiffs in my life. This is Great Dane. So um, he, he got confused there. I Those don't. are two different <laughs> yep. types of dogs. It's fine. He's excited on his big day. It's his big day. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's very excited. Then he starts talking about Psalm 141 and continues with these big hand motions, almost touching the pile so many times, just beaming with joy as he throws all these pump fakes of anticipation about the dog shit. And then he finally gets to the line he wants, which is about presenting your prayer to God like incense and that's when he smashes his hands into the pile of dog shit. And he goes to town oh, it, on oh, this pile of shit. Like, like he was giving it a massage. So uh, excited. Look, I don't like to kink shame, but this is just so obviously what that is, right? He wants to be a poopy boy and we all have to watch <laughs> him. It's like if we all just started announcing our kinks between headlines. It's yeah. not. <laughs> that's for you time. That's for you at your house. So the reaction from the audience is pretty great, too. Most of them are like, dude, what? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Or just, yes. you know, staring in complete silence because their pastor is clearly having a stroke and he's just shoved his hands into a pile of dog shit. And then we get the rest of the sermon from the happiest man I've ever seen because yep. Pastor Dan, he's just the guy who really enjoys the fun, squishy feeling of handling dog shit. And he <laughs> finally had a moment of true honesty in his life. I'm actually really happy for him. He's living his best life. Okay, you know what, Heath? You got a point there. Uh, outfit stuff, everybody. Yeah, no, outfit we, we stuff. Knew. Yeah. And before you like gets any more specific about what kind of outfits he wears, we're going to close the headlines there. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Eli working in a maid cafe. And when we come back, Tom and Cecil will be here because it turns out there are still more people that can go fuck themselves. Or look amazing in a maid cafe outfit. <laughs> podcast listener would you like to have a slumber party with us eli no, what don't. did we say Come about on, trying man. to fuck our listeners don't that, do that if it didn't work for heath it'll never work no, for me. no the other thing well what, what else did we oh, say oh don't do it on the air exactly there you go no but guys i'm not trying to fuck them i'm inviting them to our patron only pajama party next week august 7th starting at 6 p.m We'll be sending out the live stream link to all of our patrons on all of our shows. So if someone's been waiting to throw us a buck or two, there's never been a better time to do it. That's right. We'll be playing games, answering questions. Eli's going to do magic. That's the only one of our personal things that we're going to do that he's written into this script. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I sure am. Great. Yeah, Eli's going to do that, and that's it. But that's not all, actually. <laughs> We will be posting pics, updates, and general behind-the-scenes fun all week long. So it's like you're on vacation with us. Yeah. That's right. Plus, you get to see Morgan, Tim, Andrew Torres, and maybe even a special guest or two. Oh, that's got me nervous. So head over to the patreon.com slash scathingatheist and toss us what you can. The Pajama Party. The only sleepover invitation from Eli you should ever say yes to. How dare you? To do the job we do here on The Scathing Atheist, you really have to love to hate things. Well, sometimes we love to hate things so much that we just can't fit all the hate into one episode, and that was the case a few weeks ago when Tom and Cecil came on to chip away at those vulgarity for charity roasts. So we thought we'd take a few minutes to share some of the insults that didn't quite make it last time. All right, time for round three. The category is religious leaders. Heath, you're up next. This one comes from Jessica, 
And your target is the late great Harold Camping. Oh, <laughs> Camping. Fantastic. So Harold Camping, if you're not familiar, is the guy who used his degree in civil engineering from UC Berkeley to predict the end times using math. He predicted the date of the end times using his civil engineering degree mm-hmm. and math. He said it would happen on September 6th, 1994. And also September 29th, 1994. <laughs> and also October 2nd, 1994. <laughs> God just like bumped it a couple weeks. Mm-hmm, then a couple yeah, a couple, and then a couple of years. And then, yeah, yeah, and then a bunch of years. He also predicted it for May 21st, 2011. So you guys remember Pete Best? <laughs> the drummer of the Beatles before Ringo? Yeah, Harold Camping is the Pete Best of prophecy. <laughs> of end times prophecy. All right, Cecil, I got one for you from Sophia. Your target is Pastor Ricky Rosado. Oh, my God, the picture of this guy. He looks like Gene Okerlund's from the back stunt double. It's looking amazing. <laughs> you look like... You look at the stock image they use for the sex offender website before they upload the actual mug shot. <laughs> so rough. It's like if an unwanted sweaty hand on the small of your back was a person. <laughs> okay, so Noah, Dan wants a roast of Catholic priest Frank Pavoni. Oh, Frank Pavoni, the, the guy who fishes aborted fetuses out of the trash and names them. Yeah. <laughs> the guy who did a Trump ad where he slapped a fetus up onto an altar like he was about to ask you how thin you wanted yours sliced. The guy who <laughs> totally, by the way, did not embezzle from his charity, even though he never provided a reasonable explanation as to how a group that collected tens of millions of dollars over the last few years and spent less than 63% of its revenue on programs wound up $1.4 million in debt. Yeah, <laughs> that asshole huh. looks like if you picked Mike Pompeo before he was ripe. <laughs> okay, Tom, you're up next. Julian wants you to, quote, grill the shit out of Gerald Ridsdale, a pedophile priest. Cool, 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 cool. Pedophile priest. A phrase which at this point feels unnecessarily redundant. Okay. Uh, you want me to grill the shit out of this guy? And I'm I'm not going to lie. I'm honestly at a bit of a loss. Typically what I'll do with these, I'll take some detail from what the roast request is. And I'll try to intuit something about the character or maybe the future of the roastee. But I don't have any way to do this here. I don't know what motivates a pedophile priest. I don't know how to assassinate the character of an actual villain. I, I don't want to know. I don't want to speculate or empathize or to look too deeply into that abyss. What I want is for these fuckers to be rooted out and flushed down the social drain to die alone and starved of human comfort for as many lonely hours as their wretched bodies will continue to pump the fucking icker through their worthless veins. <laughs> and Jesus even Christ. though I know there is no hell, I want them to die afraid of it. <laughs> like eyes wild and bugging out with fear. And I want that fear to engulf and to envelop them and to consume every inch of them and to flood them with panic and dread and to never let up. <laughs> so I'm not sure I can do it. Okay. <laughs> so we got to get you given speeches for the church. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> doing a graduation <laughs> speech. <There you> <laughs> All right. And Eli, you're going to close out this round. Rachel wants a roast of Texas cult leader Yisrael Buffalo Bill Hawkins. What now? Okay. So for those of you who don't know, this guy is basically a Nick Cage villain that Nicolas Cage would have sent back to the writer's room for being too broad. (laughs) He runs a a cult that's taken over a town. He does all kinds of horrible shit with kids. and, And he's just like a generally terrible person. But to be fair to Israel, if you look like Bob Odenkirk disguising himself with a salt and pepper wig and hillbilly teeth, you too would have taken over a town to get late. So <laughs> yeah, fair. He's like a pedophile Halloween costume, but like not a good, like off brand. Right. <laughs> like like if, if pedophile was a TM. Like it came free with the van. Right, yeah, exactly. It looks like an old timey miner comes to middle schools and tells you about the dangers of the gold rush. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this sounds like it's time for another spightning round. We have no control over that. Uh, just when the noises go off, we have to do it. The category is politicians, <laughs> and I want you to tell me if your roasty was running unopposed, who would your write-in candidate be? So, Heath, you're up first with a request from Jonathan. Who did you write in instead of voting for Mitch McConnell? 
<laughs> okay. Good question. So I figured a good senator is all about being racially sensitive. And of course, you want good viscosity, right? Sure. <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, I wrote in a warm bottle of Aunt Jemima syrup. Oh, there you go. <laughs> sensitive, better viscosity. Significant better, step yeah, up better. in both categories. Yeah, okay. So, Cecil, this one's for Jamie. Who did you write in for Boris Johnson? Sargon of Akkad. He was farther <laughs> left and he thinks higher of women. So oh. I put him in instead. <laughs> okay, Noah, back to you. This is from Dennis. Who was your write-in for Greg Russ of the New York City Housing Authority? <laughs> yeah, his job is to make sure there's plenty of safe, affordable housing in New York City. <laughs> Doing a bang-up job there. I can see why they literally pay you more than the fucking mayor. Really? I feel like I'm writing in Bob Vila or maybe Samuel L. Jackson's character from <laughs> Caveman's Valentine. <laughs> Uh, great. Tom, you're up next. Uh, Cornell wants to know your right in for Danish far right politician Rasmus Paludan. Holy shit. I, despite looking like something that's sloughed off of Danny DeVito in the shower, come back to life. <laughs> Rasmus still manages to be a white supremacist despite obvious personal mirror based evidence to the contrary. <laughs> So I guess, like, were I Danish, I would write in an actual cheese Danish to run again. <laughs> because seriously, a cheese Danish would be vastly more palatable, vastly more agreeable, and somehow still less creamy looking. <laughs> okay, but Tom, as he we know from creamy. a year-long feud, he would lose to candidate donuts. So you got to be here. Okay. 100%. All right. 100%. Not if it was ranked choice voting. Anyway, okay. <laughs> It's a bad system. <laughs> <laughs> we need to condorse it for these donuts. And <laughs> All right. So, Eli, this one is for uh, Angelo Madrid. Yes, the Angelo Madrid. Ooh. Ooh. Who was your write in for Australian Minister for Home Affairs, Peter Dutton? Oh, God. OK, so, uh, on appearance alone, I'm going to go with Opie from Family Guy. You know, the, the one who works at Peter's job, who got the board lodged in his head. <laughs> I mean, at that point, you might as well vote for Peter Dutton. But in spirit, I would definitely write in Opie. Peter Dutton looks like he was hit in the back of the head with what history will think of him at all times. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> all right, for the next round, the category is family. Heat. Dom Toretto's a stupid character. Vin Diesel can't act. That is what? <laughs> demonstrably true, but we haven't started yet. Ashton okay. we are in a fight. wants you to roast his dad, Martin, <laughs> and his dad's three dogs, Arya, Rascal, and Loki. Okay, so we got a photo of Martin sleeping in a chair with all three dogs on top of him. First of all, Martin might be dead. Like, I, <laughs> I really hope not, but there's a non-zero chance you're hearing about this a year and a half after finding your dead father, like, Kind of velcroed to these dogs with decomposing flesh, oh, and you have to kind of just like tear it slowly. But you're not sure if fast is better. Oh, you go fast is definitely you think fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that might have happened. Decent chance. <laughs> Best case scenario, he's alive and he's about to get removed from an off-track betting because you're not allowed to sleep here, sir. <laughs> I know I'm supposed to roast the dogs too, but Arya and Rascal are golden retrievers, so no. No, but, doing that. <laughs> but Loki, that third dog, very clearly has one eye partially missing, I think. Yeesh. And not like gracefully what? and cute. <laughs> I thought eyes were a zero sum situation. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's not looking good. Whenever people meet these dogs, it's like, ha, good boy, good girl, good boy. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> okay, but good good boy still, but wow. <laughs> Rescue, huh? He rescued this one. <laughs> <laughs> Who rescued you? Am I right? <laughs> you rescued her. I can see the eye. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and Cecil, John and Kara would like a roast of mother-in-law Tony, and I'm assuming that's the biological mother for one of them. It can't be both of their. Well, I guess okay. it could be. I don't. I don't. It says we have a lot of southern here, listeners. Man, it says there Tony that you sometimes eat and miss. Your own mouth? <laughs> How is that possible? You look like a Zarlock pit with eyes. It's impossible to miss. It says that she's a constantly yowling, jaundice, shambling mound of flesh. She's not your mother-in-law. She's from the Dunwich Horror. She's young Zarlock, man. <laughs> okay, Noah, you're up next. Another mother-in-law, Jackson, wants a roast of Rebecca. 
Yeah, she's an anti-abortion Catholic conspiracy theorist mommy blogger. So I feel like I've kind of been roasting oh my her my God. whole life. You're right. Yeah. You know, just, this is now catching up to the request. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a picture. And in the two years since Jack requested this roast, the blog has been taken down, probably because she was <laughs> on to them. So all I can really say is good job accidentally teaching atheism in that home school of yours, Rebecca. <laughs> all right, Tom, this one's for you. Mark wants a roast of his mom, Jennifer. Oh, Mark, I feel you, man. Your mom, she's an asshole. That's probably not just the alcohol talking. You know what? Even if it is, it's still her. And you may not know this because we've all been kind of taught that mom is a sacred title, but it's not. She's shit. And her number responds to the block button just like anyone else's will, Mark. <laughs> she's not keeping herself in your life because she wants to offer you love and support and connection. She's keeping herself in her life because she thinks her title as mom means you have to put up with her bullshit tantrums. But you don't. She's just another boring, self-righteous, screamy drunk. There are a dime a dozen, and you can replace her anytime just by shopping at bad liquor stores after 10 p.m. and finding someone buying wine in boxes or booze in plastic bottles. <laughs> it's, well, it's just a better deal. It's, 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 it's about economics. So uh, just go ahead and get out a big red stamp and write no across that thing and cut that shit out of your life and let her scream and rage at the shadow of her former self alone. You don't need to be the fucking witness for it. Amen. Yep. And Eli Carroll wants a roast of her son, Ashton. Okay, now Ashton's a listener, got Carol into the show. Apparently, Ashton drives everyone crazy with his big groaner puns. Uh, so let me see if I can do one here, Ashton, for you. Uh, Ashton, you're like a, a fancy sweater. Everyone was hoping you died in Afghanistan. Whoa! <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, so. No? Too far? Too far? Oh. Okay. <laughs> You look like John Cena's before picture, John C minus. There you okay, go. <laughs> <laughs> Hope that sense of humor you talked about, Carol, is really great. <laughs> Hope you weren't a liar, Carol. Carol's a liar if you're mad at John. Oh, okay. It's been two years. He may have died in Afghanistan at this point. So all no, right. he's out now. It's, oh, okay. Okay. I wouldn't have done that. Yeah. Well, we're all, all out. Now. Everybody so. comes back to life when we leave. <laughs> yeah. That's how that works. And that's going to do it for this week's installment of Vulgarity for Charity. I'd thank Tom and Cecil, but they're not actually here. And if I'm not mistaken, and I could very much be mistaken, we only got one segment left to do. So if you're still waiting on your roast, you won't have to wait long. Before we scroll down and click accept this week, I want to assure you that, yes, that was a completely different Kevin Sorbo Farnsworth quote this week. It was Christmas themed because apparently it was sent to us in late 2019 and I completely missed it in my inbox. Chris resent it when he heard the last one last week. So apologies, Chris, for missing this awesome Christmas present for so long. And thanks so much for getting it for us. And to Case Orbs, dude, after two paid clips here, I feel like you owe us a drink. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern time on Monday. An even newer episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. And an even newer episode of our half sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, this show would have a funny smell if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for never copping out. I want to thank Eli Bosnick for never outing cops. I want to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Lucians for feeding the cats this morning so I could sleep in a bit and uh, other stuff too. I also want to thank Tom and Cecil from the Cognitive Dissonance Podcast for ripping more new assholes with us this week. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's mightiest mammals, Elizabeth, Mark, Ninja, Emmy, Kepi, Dave, Nathan, William, Derek, Anna, Scott, Socrates, and Ian. Elizabeth, Mark, Ninja, Emmy, and Kepi, whose thoughts are so deep Chicago tried to make a piece out of them. Dave, Nathan, William, and Derek, whose erections have at least as much claim to astronaut status as Musk or Bezos. And Anna, Scott, Socrates, and Ian, whose brains are so massive zombies get a commemorative t-shirt if they can eat one in a single sitting. Together, these 12 Twitter-pated Twizzlers have helped us tweeze the twitchy twonks who are religious. I'm sorry, there's not enough words that start with TW. I mean, there's probably something about... Catholic priest twerking for tweens in there, but damned if I could figure it out. Anyway, they gave us money, which was awfully nice of them. If you'd like to do the same, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash scathing atheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad free version of every episode, or you can make a one time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but money's too expensive, you can also help a ton by leaving us a five star review, telling a friend about the show, or following at PIAT pod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres, Tim Robertson handles our social media, and our audio engineers, Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, find all the contact info on the contact page at scalingadius.com. Last week, the court, uh, uh
the Court of Justice of the European Union issued. I like that you got flustered that we complimented your pun. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> I'd like to thank my mother and my father and Shel- <laughs> Shel- Shel- Silverstein, whose puns really brought okay, it home. Okay, we're going to play the music. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.